about our preparations for a new advent among us. We light the third candle of joy in the darkness to help us find our way. In the darkness we lose direction. We cannot see where we have been or where we are going. Three candles lighting the darkness increases our sense of safety and strength. show the way, making our darkness bright as God's day. God of Advent, on the second Sunday in Advent, the light of the days grow shorter, so that we will be ready for your face to shine on us as reading comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 35 verses 1 through 10 and it reads the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it the majesty of Carmel and Sharon they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. 
Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless cell shall sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 46, the second part, through 55. My soul shall magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> So this, this morning, our, our theme of reflection is called Advent is like traveling home. And to be honest, this reflection um, proved to be really challenging for me. Um, I wrestled with it all week long. And, even, um, and I didn't even sleep well last night <laughs> thinking about it. Um, and last night, I was racking my brain. Advent is like traveling home. Uh, this is a really difficult metaphor for me um, because for most of my life I felt like I had no home. Um, at five years old, our family, a family of four, left South Korea, Seoul, um, where we lived together in my grandmother's large home with extended family, all of my uncles and aunts on my mother's side. Um, between my grandmother, aunts and uncles, my parents had about 12, 13 built-in adult babysitters. <laughs> they never had to worry about childcare, never. Um, we ate together in the same room. And at night, we pulled out mats and we slept in the same room. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night to peer over at like 15 adults sleeping. And I never felt safer in my life. And of course, my brother and I were the only children in the house. So we were pampered. <laughs> we were pampered. My uncles loved us. They were constantly taking pictures of us, um, taking us for ice cream, which at the time was a real luxury. And if you wanna, I'll set the stage for you, third world South Korea, post-war, post -war, um, still industrializing, but pretty poor. And one of my favorite treats were bananas but they were imported and incredibly expensive. My uncles would save their money and get me bananas. 
-hmm. because they knew how much I loved them. Now that joy and peace of mind that came from feeling so safe, it came to an abrupt end. Um, the moment, the moment our little family of four landed in O'Hare International Airport in Chicago, Illinois. My parents had, had, had friends who housed us. We, we went with virtually nothing. And he had friends who housed us, but as far as I was concerned, they were strangers, and I did not feel comfortable around them. Not like I did in my grandmother's house. And when we finally moved to an apartment of our own, it was just the four of us. In Korea, there were many hands that made for light work, like putting up a Christmas tree, you know? <laughs> Uh, last week with many hands. But in the States, it was just the four of us. And two of us were children. So the burden fell on my parents, and most of it on my mother, because my father was a traditional Korean man who did nothing domestic, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't take care of kids, didn't change diapers, didn't do laundry, didn't do dishes. That, that was the role. So most of that fell on my mother. And in the States, we found ourselves to be different. We were the foreigners. We spoke a different language. We didn't understand English very well. We ate different food. We followed different customs. And my mother, having come from a Buddhist household, she believed in a different religion from the majority here in the United States. And because we were immigrants, we did run up against people who perceived us as threats. We were interlopers, and they treated us that way. I heard people say to both my parents and to me, you don't belong here. Coming here to steal our jobs and take our homes Go back to your own country. Go back to where you belong. And honestly, I think my parents at the time were trying to protect my brother and I by not talking about it, by not talking about how it affected them, but by not talking about it, by not asking my brother and I what we were experiencing and having us confide in them. My brother and I learned at a very young age that when it came to adversities, we were on our own. When it came to adversities, we had to figure it out for ourselves. So in the United States, we didn't even have the safety of being a family of four. We were a family of, of just individuals. And I honestly think this is the reason why my brother never confided in me that he was being bullied throughout elementary school and middle school. He was being bullied and getting into fights. And he never told me. And it broke my heart when he told me years later. Now in Korea, he could have confided in any one of our uncles and our grandmother who was not someone you pushed around. <laughs> you know, this woman lost her husband and had to make a life and care for eight children, and she did that. And so if we had told her, if my brother had told her what was going on, you best believe those bullies would have been dealt with. Now, here's an insight into me. No one dared bully me. Because I inherited from my mother the, the Korean glare that could stop that behavior with just one look, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and I dare say it is ubiquitous. Every mother has that glare, or several glares. I made a TikTok video about it. <laughs> it's gotten like 4.2 million views or something crazy like that. But no one did that. To me, but they did to my brother. And we were foreigners in a foreign land. And no matter how hard we tried to learn the language and speak it without a trace of an accent, 
We would always look different, right? We would always look like foreigners and be treated as perpetual foreigners. And for reasons my parents never shared with my brother and I, we moved around a lot. This one, this one afternoon, my brother and I decided to count how many schools we had, we had been enrolled in. And between kindergarten and sixth grade, we counted nine different schools. Yeah. And sometimes we went to two schools in one calendar, school calendar year. We didn't stay in one place long enough to make friends. My brother and I were always the new kids in school. And you know how hard that can be? Mm -hmm. So yeah, this metaphor of traveling home, that's a tough one for me to wrap my mind around. The idea of home was something other people seem to understand and have a grasp of so much better than me. I was forever looking in from the outside when it came to this concept of home. And just like Christmas, I'm sorry, but I did not grow up with with a concept of Christmas, American Christmas in particular. As a kid in Korea, we just did not celebrate that. Now we do, but back then, you know, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, we did not celebrate Christmas. So it wasn't until the second or third grade that I learned, that I learned these ideas of Christmas. Um, our, our teacher decided that year we were going to make handmade gifts for our mothers. And I had no idea why we were doing this. So I asked my classmates, what's Christmas? And they looked horrified and they just began flooding me with information about this. This old white man in a red suit, he brings good little boys and girls presents on Christmas day. And if you're lucky, your house will be decorated with a Christmas tree and lights. But bad boys and girls, they got lumps of coal in their stocking. You don't want to be one of those, right? And here I am, this kid, trying to fit in. And I was, I'm like, I can get behind this Christmas thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked exceptionally hard at making these gifts for, for my, my mom and my dad. And on Christmas morning that year, I got up early and handed my parents these gifts, much to their confusion, because they had, we were not Christmas people. And so they opened up these, these very humble gifts and didn't know what to say. And needless to say, there were no gifts for my brother. There were no gifts, nothing underneath a tree. There was no tree. But I was determined. I wanted, I wanted our family to, to get on this Christmas bandwagon. And so I begged for a Christmas tree, begged. And one year my father brought home an artificial tree that took forever to put up, right? <laughs> and when we counted the cost of how much it, it all took to decorate this one tree with ornaments and tinsel and, and whatnot, that was it. That's all we got. When, you, when you're poor and you're struggling to survive, you're not thinking of how to decorate your home. You're thinking of how to put food on the table and how to keep the lights on. And so those resources are dedicated for something else besides a lavish Christmas. So it didn't take long for me to figure out that maybe Christmas is not for me, not for families like mine, not for foreign families anyway. And for years, we just went along as December 1st came and went, and it was another day. But we started going to church. And at church, <coughs> the Korean church, my family found a place where we could belong, a place where we weren't foreigners. And then along the way, I learned of the person of Jesus who was born a refugee. 
his parents, Mary, and his stepfather, Joseph. Remember, he was a stepfather. They had to cross borders to get to safety. They were fleeing violence. And Jesus was born. And immediately after, they had to cross into Egypt, where they were foreigners in a foreign land. And through that story, I saw a reflection of me and my family. And I thought, maybe Christmas is for me. Maybe Christmas is for my family, too. Now, I found a home. <coughs> I found a home in these stories, these stories of Jesus that I could relate to, the person of Jesus. Now, Isaiah speaks of a highway, right? A highway of safety. And I, and I wanted to give you a visual. Okay, this is just a representation. This is a metaphor, this highway. In the ancient world, traveling long distances was expensive and it was dangerous. These, this highway, you know, we, we don't, we can't imagine because traveling is so easy for us. You know, you just get in your car, you take you know, you take Route 1 or you take, you know, Wilmington Pike and you're at your destination. But travel in the ancient world was usually on foot or, if you're lucky, on a donkey. And these highways, they weren't plentiful. They were trade routes. And so because they were trade routes, there were a lot of goods going back and forth. And when there are a lot of goods going back and forth, there are bandits. For and at that time, shepherds were considered in the category of bandits. Yeah, yeah. So, and they, they were called the highways because they were actually elevated above the rest of the terrain. So if you fell off the path, you fell off the path. Yeah, they were elevated up. They were lifted up. And so the Hebrew word for highway is masila. And it has several meanings. It could mean a thoroughfare, a turnpike, but it could also mean a ladder. And another aspect of the word highway, it means raised up, cast up, elevated up. So if we take it as a metaphor, it, this highway is a higher way, a higher way of being, a higher way, a illuminated way, an enlightened way of being and thinking. It could be a higher spiritual way of being. Now our family, traveled back to Korea when I was a child. And I found from my experience that it was, it was changed, or at least I was changed. We were both changed. I had become more American in my time in the States. And Korea had started to evolve, come into its own. And the home that I knew no longer existed. That was in the past. And it took me many years, many, many years, to figure out that home wasn't a place, or a structure, or even in a memory. I couldn't travel to a place to find home. I couldn't travel to the past to find home journey that I had to take was not out there, it was in here. The journey, the traveling I had to do was to journey inside, to go inward. Because within me, within you, and within all of us is Christ. Christ born in us, and us born from above. Now last night, 
when I was racking my brain, I asked my daughter, what, what does home mean to you? And without hesitating, she said, you and dad. And I realized that what I longed for was something I was able to reflect for her. The love, the safety, the peace of mind. I had given her home. And someday, my hope is that when I ask her that same question again, what does home mean to you? My hope is that she will be able to say and know for herself, it is me. I am home. And I make home for others. And that's what we're doing. This, this road we travel is all back to us. And we make home for each other. You make home for me. And I make home for you. And the light of Christ is home for us all. May it be so for you. And also for me. <coughs> <coughs> who helped in Megan's absence with the music ministry, and I was able to pass out a small gift to everyone except for Pat. <laughs> so, Pat, would you help out and receive this from us, and a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a blessing Thank to be involved here. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ruby. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. You were good. Thank you. you were good. And when Rachel returns, she'll have something as well. Any joys or concerns you'd like to share? I want to thank everybody for your prayers for my niece. 
She is still in the hospital, but no longer in a coma and should be coming home soon. My friend's thinking about moving from Denver to San Francisco. Not sure if she should move there. Her lease is up in a few weeks. She's freaking out, basically. She wants to, but she's afraid. Um, she's been, yeah, she's, she's afraid. <laughs> Understand that. <laughs> Take it from someone who's moved a lot. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, my brother-in-law, uh, um, Mark Gannon, uh, Jake's uh, brother, uh, is declining health. Is not doing good. And, uh, just prayers for him. <clears throat> um, He's always had a, just a terrible diet that I've always been concerned about. Bacon and white bread and Pepsi is his yeah. basic yeah. diet with no fruit or vegetable from the time that I've been in. Um, so just maybe we can just put that out there that he could maybe change that at 60 something. I don't know, but his, he's not doing really good. Really. Prayers for Mark Gannon. Boy, food is medicine, but it could also be poison, couldn't it? Mm. So, yeah. Yes, Hope. Does he need prayers for the Billings family in Marshallton, church and community, um, mm -hmm. with the sudden passing of Michael Billings, a huge presence. Mm -hmm. And for all of those going through the Christmas at this time of year, and also want to celebrate healing and new life and having friends with us once again. Yes. Thank you. And I would like to add, um, I'm just so very grateful for all the support, love from this community, um, from everyone. With my healing process, everything is going wonderful. And I'm so very grateful for everybody here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your love, support, and prayers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Prayers for those who are still sick at home, recovering, and um, doing the responsible thing by not coming in and sharing that <laughs> with us. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Continued prayers for the people of Ukraine. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. But prayers that that peace, that peace will win out and triumph in the end and the innocents will be spared. And uh, prayers for um, the revolution that seems to be going on in Iran. There's, um, I have very little information other than the little bits that are coming out in social media, but um, prayers for them and um, for the women and for the men. Um, they are, it sounds like, looking for a higher way of being, a, a, yeah, a more enlightened, illumined way of being. We could use a little bit of that here, too. So. <laughs> so as we started last week, if there are no more <coughs> prayers to share, um, you know, call, uh, call it once, twice. <laughs> okay, so we will sing the prayer of Saint Francis, and then and and then pray the Lord's prayer. I'll okay. play through it once. Yes.
pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples almost 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. slow. <laughs> maybe it's all the moving around, maybe it's all the schooling that I did and didn't receive, or maybe it's just a combination of all of the above. But finding home has taken a long time and it continues to take a long time for me to learn. 
and I'm ever so grateful I'm learning it with you. Mm. So, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the power of the Spirit, the 30 in 1, be in you, beside you, behind you, before you, as you go in peace into the world. Amen. Amen. Amen.